what, buddy? I'm just a DCS content creator. That means I answer questions. Not questions like, what is your win rate, or what kind of skins you have. Those would fall within the purviews of your first person shooters, or average games. I answer fighter jet problems. For instance, how do I get my radar to tell a missile to go kill another plane in the distance? The answer? Well, it's not exactly that easy. Longer range air to air engagements call for radar guided missiles. The weapon of choice, the AIM 120 AMRAM. So how does a fighter pilot use an AIM-120 slammer these days? Well to show you, I'll first tell you how these missiles work, and then I will walk through some real mission scenarios to show the concepts applied in real time. Radar signals travel much farther than infrared energy, so the AMRAM can be used at greater ranges than the Sidewinder. When an AIM-120 is launched, the pilot calls out FOX-3. FOX-3 is our special type of air-to-air -air missile. Essentially, it's a missile that can guide itself to a target with its own little radar found in the nose cone. Unfortunately, to fit that radar in there, it's got to be really tiny and weak, meaning the missile can't guide itself the whole way to the target. So it'll need a helping hand from a plane's much bigger, more powerful radar to guide it most of the way. Sort of like a FOX-1 would, but not really. Once it's traveled most of the way, it will activate its own radar and home in on the target by itself. Close to the target, AMRAM turns on its own radar to find the enemy. Now the AM-120 is not a super missile. Much like holding a sword by the blade instead of the hilt, the AM-120 can be rendered useless if its user does not know what he or she is doing. There are basically two things you need to know. One, your range to your target, and two, your altitude. In layman's terms, the higher and faster you are, the more lethal the missile is. I want you to imagine that you are trying to throw a pebble to a person underwater. Getting the pebble to the other person underwater will be much easier at a depth of 1 foot rather than a depth of 500 feet, because the water pressure at 500 feet is so immense and makes the water so compressed that throwing a pebble through all that water would be very difficult. Hold it right there, Romeo Victor. What the hell is water pressure and what the hell is air pressure and how does any of that work? How is stuff so much heavier and condensed at the surface of the earth? compared to 30,000 feet above the Earth. Look, I get it. Your mind might be doing something along the lines of this right now. Trust me when I say that every pilot does just want to go into the air and sling AMRAMs or sparrows or whatever and just kill everything at one time. However, if we take a more methodical approach to stuff, it's easier and more effective to employ tactics that actually work, and you'll find yourself less times in a flaming ball of fire. That's why I'm going to try and teach you how pressure works, and why it's so important when we're employing these missiles. I want you to imagine that you're carrying this book. The book weighs one pound. That's easy. You can carry one pound. Now let's add another book on top of that. It is the same book, so it also weighs one pound. Together, they make two pounds, and now you're sustaining the weight, if you are carrying both of these, of two pounds. All right? You are very strong. Two pounds. Now if we add eight more books on top of that, and you are carrying all of these books, that's a total of ten pounds. So that's how air pressure essentially works. There are these blocks of air, 40,000 feet, 30,000 feet, 20,000 feet, 10,000 feet, 0,000 feet. So all of this air is being pushed down. This air at 10,000 feet is going to be crushed by this 10,000 feet, this 10,000 feet, and this 10,000 feet. Now all that air is being condensed down here, and it's still being condensed here at 40,000 feet, but definitely not as much as zero feet. So it should make sense that since this is only being crushed a little bit compared to this stuff, it is so much easier for a tiny stick, a supersonic stick, to travel up here versus down here. And that's why, at these much higher altitudes, these missiles can go for much farther and they can keep their speeds for much longer. And therefore, they can hit the bad guy at much longer ranges. 
All right, I get it. It's bad to shoot a missile below 10,000 feet. God forbid I ever do it again. Well, sorry to make things more confusing, but that's also wrong. Remember the underwater pebble analogy? If you were trying to throw that pebble to a person at a depth of 500 feet, you still could, despite the pressure and immense water and all that BS. But there has to only be a few inches in between you and the other person. Likewise, you can still employ a slammer when you are low and slow, if the range is but a few miles. However, if the range is a few tens of miles, then you might have to make the distance easier for the missile to travel by climbing to an area with lesser air, and therefore less for the missile to resist as it flies to its target. When I engage with these slammers, I don't try to imagine shooting down another plane with a supersonic missile. I find it's easier for my mind to downscale all the speeds and imagine how I could just lob a projectile over to the other plane and just sort of tap him on the head. But hey, that's just me, and everyone flies differently. Through practice, everyone gets their own unique feel for how they fight, and the best way to get a better hit rate with these missiles and to encourage your feel for how these weapons work is to just keep trying, keep failing, and keep learning. This will be a kind of a step-by-step -step walkthrough of how I employ AMRAMs. Now, I'm not perfect, so do take what I do with a grain of salt. That said, the situation is as follows. We have two MiG-29s, 12 o'clock, closing from about 60 miles right now. There's an SA-10 off my 10 o'clock right now. I have to kill the MiG-29s without dying. The SA-10 is going to make that a little bit harder, because the SA-10 is going to force me defensive and on the deck. As we've just discussed, AMRAMs work better when you're not on the deck. So we're going to see how I deal with it. SA-10 should be spiking me any second. There it is. I said 10 spike, 10 o'clock. And there's a launch. I 10 launch, 10 o'clock. Gonna have to go defensive for that. I say 10s will kill you if you don't go defensive. Tally, it's not rendering in. Gonna have to defend that. Defensive SA-10. 29, 12, 10, 12. None of this is good. So we're masked using... SA-10. Yeah, so. so there's a call. Masked. Masked means the radar from the SA-10 can't see me. So it therefore can't lock onto me and it can't get a firing solution at all. Fortunately, it's dragged me down to about 9,000 feet, which is not high enough to outrange these MiG-29s. Let's get on these 29s. Contact. There's two. I've got them in DTT locked right there, so now I've got to figure out which target I'm going to shoot at first. 34 miles. There's me switching between the targets. I'm going to go for the high guy first. So I decided to go to the high guy first. Uh, the reason is, is because he's closer. One. He's 31 miles, 31.7. The other guy's about two or one miles behind him. But more importantly, he's higher, which means he will be able to accelerate faster and he will get a missile shot off sooner. Now, missile shots work both ways. He's going to be able to get a missile shot on me sooner. I'm going to be able to get a missile shot on him sooner as well, because we're closing faster. I'm going to try and stay masked from the SA-10 here, because he's not very happy about me. This will see music, so don't mind the head bobbing. Twenty-four, nine thousand. Okay, stop it right there. That's the SA-10 smoke right there. But more importantly, here's my altitude. These are the two things I'm concerned about. This altitude, almost ten thousand feet, and the range is twenty-two point six miles. Now I'm at seven hundred knots. Uh, that's at nine thousand, ten thousand feet though. So what I decided to do is I'm gonna pull up, I'm gonna level off as high as I can go, and I'm gonna launch both my AMRAMs on the MiG-29s. It will allow me to keep some speed, but trade it for altitude. The F-16 is a very kinetically capable jet, which is why I'm choosing this tactic. It's going to bring me up another 10,000 feet, and AMRAMs like to work at 20,000 feet. 22 miles is the other big number. A 22 mile shot at 10,000 feet hasn't worked for me in the past. It could work. Probably won't. 
because the bandits are going to maneuver and try and defend my missiles. So I'm not going to shoot at them down here at 22 miles. I need to close the distance if I'm going to do that. Or pull up to a higher altitude where a 22 mile shot would work. However, if I pull up, the SA-10 is going to have a firing solution. Now I decide to pull up, but I can't stay up there for long. I can get up there long enough to launch my MRAMs, and then I'm going to have to dive back down. I'm going to have to dive back down anyways to defend the MiG-29s, so that's part of the reason why I chose to pull up, launch, and go back down. I pull up. Here's a pop-up. A jettison center line. They don't really need it in case we get an emerge. We drop locks, unfortunately. That move on my part. There's a level off. He's launched on me. Fox three. Switch targets. Fox three. Switch targets. Offensive MiG 29s are active in six seconds. So that's the timer. So he's fired on me. I can see the missile smoke. Uh, I can see both the bandits right there. And I have the helmet mounted sight to really ensure it. And more importantly, I can see when my missile is going to go active right there. When the missile is going to go pitbull. I broke off left. Um, as usual, you always break in right or left. Any other direction than straight out of missile. The missiles coming at you turning always exponentially increases the missile's time it takes to hit you. The distance between you and the missile. More importantly, I'm going to do a maneuver that keeps my nose hot but it allows me to defend a little bit better. I'm going to roll over here on my left, go inverted, pull down, and then bank right. It allows me to keep my nose hot. It allows me to keep locks so I can keep my bandit tagged or in, in visual or whatever I need to do. Just better situational awareness and allows me to escape out of there if I really need to. For 10 o'clock here. And I will need to because the SA-10 almost certainly by this time has shot at me again. Gonna roll over and, and we can tell because the RWR is going to prioritize the MiG-29 right now because he shot at me. But it's going to change here in just a few moments and I'm going to I'm going to pick that up. If the RWR is prioritizing the SA-10 instead of the MiG-29 that shot at me, it would only do that because the SA-10 is launched on me. Pull down in the thicker air and we're pit bull. I'm going to go full defense here. And there's a 10. SA-10 is also launched on me again. So now I broke locks because both my missiles are... I've turned cold now. Both my missiles are pitbull. So when I talk about going into thicker air, just like in missile employment, missiles work better at higher air. It's easier to avoid missiles at thick air. So that's why I'm going to use thicker air to avoid missiles. Splash one. There's a smoke from... The first guy, so that's a definite visual splash, and the other guy back there, I, I can see him. I'm watching him. Got There's smoke from the second guy. And the guy splash too. Okay. And that's the whole engagement done. Now I'm free to okay. get out of this SA-10's range, which is why I'm turning left a little bit. I take a peek at him right there. We are out of there. Two splashes using two AM ramps. That's like the best I could have hoped for. So in conclusion, uh, defend the SA-10 by going low. Got my missiles off at around 21,000 feet by doing a pop-up attack. I was lucky to recatch the two bandits on radar. Both the missiles went pitbull. I made my defensive maneuver and escape maneuver out of there and got two kills. All right, so today we looked at how these long-range Fox 3s work, described a more intricate way of how the physics works on these missiles behind the scenes, and then we walked through a real scenario, applying and abusing what we know to come out on top. What's left? Well, I could describe and walk us through many scenarios where I use and abuse physics to my advantage, but frankly that would make this video exponentially longer than it needs to be, and I'm not even sure how well people like listening to me analyze this stuff in the first place. Psst. Let me know if you like this sort of thing or not. Regardless, there's one more very important step to know if you're looking at improving your Fox 3 game, and that is practice. Practice, practice, practice. When using these missiles, there's a ton of stuff us pilots have to take into consideration in a very short amount of time, and practicing will make processing all that information a much easier, more smoother, and adaptable experience. 
which in turn will make you very formidable in an actual mission. DCS gives you the gift of being able to set up your own scenarios and try out your legs. So use it, experiment, try out longer ranges, try out lower altitudes, find out what works and what doesn't. The more knowledge you have about your weapons, the more you'll be able to do in a mission. The more skills you have, the more fun you'll have using them. You've got nothing to lose, so just have fun.